someone who can relate to that. That's why I go mules. <laughs> uh, so Elserino so, Middle School. Sorry, okay. Elserino Middle School. Elserino, okay. And so since 2003, um, he has been the uh, uh, the president of uh, Griffiths Biologics until um, when did you win? Um, one year ago this one weekend. Year. Oh. That's oh. one year ago. So okay. Give you away, huh? Uh, he was responsible for overseeing more than 900 employees working in manufacturing and uh, quality control facilities, finance, compliance, um, training operations, so many different uh, scientific and non-scientific um, disciplines. And he is very involved with uh, the Workforce uh, Investment Board in Los Angeles. Uh, he is a true champion of STEM education and of preparing, the, uh, 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 preparing students for the workforce. So um, he is very involved with um, uh, workforce development and with um, uh, supporting career pathways at the local uh, university and uh, community college level. Uh, he also uh, is involved with the uh, Cradle to Career program, the youth empowerment efforts uh, to promote STEM and post-secondary education. And industry uh, and industry alliance boards um, that also support the same uh, effort. Um, and in addition to that, you uh, have a, uh, Willie has a partnership with LA Mission College. So we have representatives here from each one of those. So LA Mission College, LA Valley College, where I'm, where I work, Vertigo. Um, uh, Workforce Development Board, Glendale Community College, the Vertigo uh, Job Center, Biocom, the Biocom Institute, and more, <laughs> I guess. And he was very involved in the creation of the Los Angeles Regional Bioscience slash Biotechnology Industry uh, Valued Credential, um, which identifies the common skills and, uh, and competencies for biomanufacturing. So, um, uh, I, I, for biomanufacturing, biotechnology, and uh, laboratory technicians. So, and that of, you know, helps um, facilitate the process of uh, making sure that the graduates have the skills that are required by uh, the industry. So, without further ado, I am very honored to introduce Willie. And thank you so much for coming all the way to join us. Thank you. That was a lot. <laughs> Good afternoon. Thank you for uh, allowing me to join you for the next 30, 45 minutes or an hour, depending on how many questions you might have. So uh, I've been in industry for 43 years. Uh, I started working at what was Alpha Therapeutic as a entry level manufacturing technician. And basically over 40 years or after about 20 years, if you get into enough trouble, they make you president. <laughs> so. I was very fortunate since 2003 for the last 19 years to run that operation there. And I love what I did and I love what the industry does. So really what I'm here today is just to talk to you from a manufacturer's perspective, you know, what we're doing uh, and what, what we look for in different individuals. So, you know, when I first heard about this company and got into it, it was by sheer accident, sheer luck me personally because I ended up making a 43 year career out of it uh, but uh, I think you know when we think about biotech and industry you, you think about the front end a lot which is you hear about the scientists and the research and development and FDA approvals a lot of that gets <coughs> press and then when a drug gets approved it's a huge celebration as well as it should I mean it should be and then you're, you hear a lot about the tail end, which is the physicians who are prescribing these drugs, the pharmacists, uh, the nurses who are providing these to different patients. But a lot of times, I think people forget that there's a whole middle section because somebody has to make these amazing medicines, these amazing drugs. And, and really, that's what I wanted to speak to today. So I'm actually going to share a presentation with you that I usually, uh, well not usually, but I probably have done about, I'd say about a hundred times, maybe, <laughs> and mainly to community college levels, to high schools, 
and also to uh, other four-year universities, uh, primarily Cal State Los Angeles, which is right across the street from Griffles, and I'm an alum of Cal State LA, so we hire a lot from Cal State LA. So I'm going to talk about Griffles as a company, in case you're not familiar with Griffles. I'm going to talk about plasma and plasma proteins, which is what we uh, focused on. And then I want to talk about jobs in the pharmaceutical biotech manufacturing arena. Uh, if anyone has any questions during the process, please don't hesitate. So let's give this a shot. Okay, so first off, uh, I wanted to talk about Griffles as an organization. Uh, the site we were at is, aside from our El Sereno Junior High School, does anyone know where Griffles is located? Yes, one. Um, yeah. Lincoln Heights. Lincoln. We're at Lincoln High School. Lincoln High School. Yeah. I was supposed to go to Lincoln, but I went to Wilson. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but I, yes, I, I grew up in the Rose Hill playground area, not too far from there. But um, the site where we're at has been actually manufacturing products since the 1940s. And it's near Cal State LA, right where the 710 freeway ends on Valley Boulevard. And uh, again, it's been there working with different proteins for the last 80 plus years. And with that, I started there in 1979 as Alpha Therapeutic, which was a Japanese-owned company. And then in 2003, Griffles acquired the assets of Alpha, and that's where the Griffles family comes in. So the Griffles organization actually started in the year 1940, a lot going on in the 40s. Uh, by literally a father and two sons. You talk about mom and pop. This is what we're dealing with here. Out of Barcelona, Spain, uh, going through the efforts after the World Wars and everything that was going on. And uh, to think that today they probably have now close to 25,000 employees. It really is an amazing history that this company has. So again, founded in Barcelona, Spain. In 1951, Dr. Griffles Lucas developed what's called plasmapheresis, which is the same technique that we use today to collect human plasma, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. A couple of things to know about the United States. First off, the United States is the largest market in the world for plasma proteins. The United States also collects more plasma than anyone in the world. So for Griffles to truly become a global player, they needed to get into the US. Being a Spanish-speaking company, they already had a lot of assets and sales and efforts in Latin America, in Europe, where they were founded, but they needed to get into the US. And that started happening big time in the early 2000s. So in 2002, they acquired Seracare, which was a company that owned some plasma collection centers. 2003, acquired Alpha Therapeutic. So I came into Griffles via an Alpha employee with a new owner. And in 2006, you can see that we started to purchase another set of uh, donation centers from a different company. 2011 was a huge, huge year for Griffles because uh, we were able to acquire one of our larger, major competitors. Truly David and Goliath style, it was amazing. And uh, they're now our largest manufacturing operation based in uh, North Carolina. And uh, again, huge, huge day for us. Griffles also has a diagnostic arm in the company. I'm not gonna to speak to that as much today, but we did acquire two other companies in California, one in Emeryville, up north in the Bay Area, and one in San Diego. In 2020, we established a strategic alliance with Shanghai Ross, headquartered in China. We bought another manufacturing facility in Canada and in 2022, 
Grifols acquired BioTest, which is another plasma protein manufacturer in Germany. So no fear mm -hmm. in this company. They just continue to grow and grow and grow. So now, as I mentioned, we have uh, over 24,000 employees. That number keeps growing. 70% of those employees are in the US, uh, primarily because we have most of our collection centers in the US. Different product and service licenses in over 100 different countries. So we're talking truly a global operation here. And over 30 different subsidiaries. What I mean by that is buildings that has a Griffles name tag, name plate, in many different parts of the world. So, so it's been a phenomenal, phenomenal growth from that perspective. Griffles is now the third largest player in this market globally. So when you look at manufacturing facilities, we have the original, I want to make sure I, oh, I did the wrong one. The, I think it turned off the. This is the laser yeah, I, I know that now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's okay. <laughs> so the original facility in Barcelona, Spain. Uh, the next facility was the uh, purchase of the Alpha Assets in 2003. We talked about the Clayton, North Carolina expansion. At that point, they started building their own new facility in Dublin, Ireland, which is now up and running. And then we purchased the new operation in Montreal, Canada. What doesn't show here is the operation in Germany. That's also now in place. So just continue to explode. So now I really want to focus on Los Angeles, which is similar to the other plants, um, smaller than North Carolina and Spain, <laughs> but a little bias, I, also, I, I think it's the best of the plants. <laughs> so, what do we do here in Los Angeles? We have over 800 highly skilled employees. Uh, we've invested millions of dollars in capital. And really what we're doing is large scale good manufacturing processing. And this is key, and we'll talk about this some more, because it's not test tubes, it's not bench tops. We have test tubes and bench tops in our chemistry lab. When you talk about the facility and the plant, this is truly large scale. Uh, we do have research and development. We have over 400 people in R&D between North Carolina and Spain. Uh, and again, committed to product safety and quality. So this is an overview of the site here in Los Angeles. So this is our manufacturing facility. We have our own QC laboratory. We probably do easily over 95% of our own testing. We have a full micro lab and chemistry lab. Do you have to also uh, pay for a non-in-house QC testing as well? Is that required? No. We do some testing out, but that's more out of our own convenience, or maybe we didn't invest on a certain piece of equipment. But generally speaking, can do all of our testing if we were obviously we're <laughs> inspected we need to make sure we're doing it right but yes so again QC lab I want to make sure we, we understand that the plant and the QC lab is a truly operating 24 7 we don't stop I shouldn't say that we stop twice a year because we actually close all operations a hundred percent empty out the entire plant which takes us about a week to do. And then we do maintenance and engineering work <laughs> over the next two weeks or so that you just can't do when you're making product. Most of our employees take time off during those two weeks in the summer. And then we also take two weeks off during the Christmas holidays. We have uh, corporate offices here. We have three different warehouse facilities where we're keeping filters, vials, chemicals. A lot of that has to be temperature controlled and quality controlled. But a uh, pretty busy place. 
pretty busy place. It's very misleading because when you drive down Valley Boulevard here, which is the main avenue here around the freeway, all you really see is this entrance. Yeah, we see the Griffel Sun. So. Yeah, but this is about 23 acres from that perspective. <coughs> We also have a facility in the city of industry that we use for packaging of the final product and distribution. We also keep the plasma here until it's ready to manufacture. So what do we do as a company when we're working with plasma proteins? Really what we're focusing on is separating and purifying certain proteins, certain human proteins from plasma collected from healthy donors and putting that in a pile. And those proteins are then used to treat rare, chronic, and at times life-threatening conditions. So the people who work in this industry, and I've always told every one of our employees, you truly do save lives. Whether you work in accounting, in manufacturing, in maintenance, it takes 800 people to make one vial of product. This is something we've always focused on here because everyone has to be part of this effort. A couple of the uh, products that we'll speak to, uh, one is albumin, which is used to treat shock and trauma victims who have lost a lot of blood, hemophilia, and primary immune deficiency, which is uh, basically individuals who lack functioning antibodies to fight off diseases. So albumin is actually how our industry started in the 1940s. What was going on in the 40s? World War. So Dr. Edward Cohn was uh, asked by the United States government to develop some kind of treatment that we could use on the battlefield when individuals were getting wounded, losing blood, and again, how do you treat someone on a battlefield? Especially if they're going into shock from blood loss. You know, how do you blood type someone in the middle of a battlefield? How do you keep whole blood refrigerated so that you can give it to the individuals? There was just no way. So albumin is actually the most abundant protein in the human body. And what we did was we created, uh, Dr. Rucon basically created a bottle of albumin proteins that was then injected right on the, literally on the battlefield to be able to treat these individuals. It doesn't have to be typed. It can be stored at room temperature. And today, if you go to pretty much to any emergency room around the world, you're gonna find this product. Because it's used for the exact same reason all of these decades later. So this again is how our industry started. How was it temperature, how was it not temperature sensitive? It has stabilizers added to it. All of these proteins are very, very uh, unstable, bottom line. So if you don't add stabilizers, or one of these products, for example, is also freeze-dried, uh, there's no way that it will last. I mean, some of the lives of these proteins could be counted in days. So yes, we have albumin, for example, has a shelf life of three years at room temperature. Does anyone know someone with hemophilia? Yes. My aunt does. hemophilia. So there's only 20,000 hemophilia patients in the entire United States. 20,000 out of what, 320 plus million people? So this truly is a very rare disease. And what you're talking about are individuals, and it's generally hereditary in nature, individuals who are lacking either the factor eight protein or the factor nine pro uh, protein, which is required for what we call the clotting cascade. We get a cut, yeah, we can cry a little, <laughs> but we know it's gonna stop. Do they completely lack it, or are there degrees there's of lacking? There's different degrees. I have a dog that yeah. has So if you have process. severe hemophilia, uh, you know, a serious injury where you're losing blood can very much, it, it would very easily lead to death more than an individual who doesn't have it at all. Pulling a tooth, 
can be a traumatic. And decades ago, before these drugs existed, you can only imagine how many people with this unfortunate disease were impacted. Uh, an another thing to note about this disease is that you will find patients with hemophilia all over the globe. It's not related to geography, to race, to economical conditions. This truly is passed on from individuals. Normally, females with hemophilia don't have as many of the symptoms or may have be non-symptomatic, but their sons may get the <coughs> disease. Uh, so a lot of times, it's very difficult for the family because they gotta make a decision should we have children? Because they need to know that there's a chance that that child may have hemophilia. And uh, many times they'll know because if it's a, a, a normal birthing process, the baby may come out bruised. Or if, it's, if the male baby is circumcised within their hospital stay. They won't be able to control the baby. So these individuals are talking about eating this product literally from the day they're born until the day they die. There's actually just recently a gene uh, treatment that was licensed by the FDA. I don't know if, it, it, I have to do a little more research on that, whether its intention is to cure the disease, but with the products that we've used up to this point in time, we cannot treat, we can only have them live more of a normal life. The immune globulin literally is a bottle of antibodies. So your antibodies are your proteins. If you don't have a, enough antibodies or they're not functioning properly, you're not gonna have a very healthy or normal life. You're gonna get sick all the time. It's going to take longer to get over an easily a common cold to whatever it may be. Uh, this disease state many times is misdiagnosed with little ch with children because they're born with it in many cases. Uh, so again, another product that for someone who is lacking these proteins, they'll have to take for their entire life. The care for these products, if I go back to, I'm sorry, to factor eight, you know, these come in 20 ml vials, and the cost of a vial is easily over a thousand dollars, easily. And they have to take five, ten vials a week. Oh every Adults week. every week for the rest of their life. Adults, because it's given, it's dosed by weight. Adults may take even more. So you can only imagine what what a trauma this is to the individuals to the health system, to the economical aspect of this. And I think the other thing is it truly impacts the entire family. It's not just the patient. Uh, so again, very difficult disease state. And these, one of the reasons why it's so expensive is because of the amount of plasma that's needed to treat a patient. And when you look at here, for example, someone with hemophilia, we're talking about 1,200 donations per year to treat an average patient. And we'll talk a little bit about the donation process so you can understand that. So, question, you're telling me the donations are for one person a year? Yeah. And for how long, I mean, how many vials can you make for those 1,200 donations? Uh, depending on the assays, but we're talking about I, 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 we're in the four or five hundred vials range for with one donor, for example. Roughly, with one donation, how much vial can you use? With one donation, a high dose vial, which is primarily what they use in the United States, uh, we, we're lucky, it probably takes about five donations to make one vial. Oh, okay. And that's an easier way to, to say it. So, has anyone ever donated plasma? Clayton? Okay. How about whole blood? No plasma donors, right? So let's talk about, you've donated plasma? 
No, um, just plug. Okay. So let's talk about the difference. Because for this industry, this is everything. This is everything. And we talked about Dr. Griffles Lucas and what he did in 1951. This is why it was so huge. So right now, you can donate whole blood. If you go and donate blood, they'll take about 300 ml or so of blood, a small quantity, in a bag, <coughs> normally. And you can't donate again for another 60 days or so. Why? No you need to regenerate the red blood cells, yeah. the white blood cells, the platelets. But let's focus on the red blood cells because those are what's most abundant mm -hmm. in blood. So there are some countries who will not use plasma collection centers and who will use whole blood and then separate the parts from whole blood. Mm -hmm. But the reality is those countries cannot be self-sufficient because they don't have enough plasma proteins to be able to use for their patients. So here in the US, we use plasmapheresis. So again, what we're doing literally is taking whole blood from a donor, removing the plasma, literally centrifuge on the spot. We remove plasma, which you'll see in a minute, is 90% water. And then the big difference here is right in the donation process, we're re-injecting the red blood cells, the white blood cells, and the blood cells. To the dome. Right then and there. So by doing so, and being that most of this is water, they can donate up to maybe eight, 900 mLs instead of 300. And they can do it up to twice a week if they'd like. So it takes about an hour and a half to donate. So the industry, including Griffles, reimburses the donors for their time. Uh, typical, depending on where you're at, it could be $40 a donation. But the honest truth is without these donors, we wouldn't have enough plasma proteins to make for the patients, to have for the patients. And uh, there are many donors who will donate once a week, some twice a week, for years. Golden donors for, for us as an industry. And I'm not talking about just Griffles, I'm talking about the whole plasma industry. Because we need it. We need it. And I think from that standpoint, it is crucial. So if we look at this process a little bit more, again, here's whole blood. We're breaking it down. 55% of blood is plasma, 90% of plasma is water. Only 7% of plasma, which is what, maybe 3.5% of blood, are the proteins. And we're talking about hundreds and hundreds of proteins here, and we're after just one. So this, again, starts talking them up to the complexity of manufacturing plasma proteins. And these are some of the proteins that we've spoken to. And again, if I go back to this slide, you can tell I'm retired, right? Because I haven't done this for a while. <laughs> but can you produce albumin now? Can you insert the gene for albumin? And there is no gene therapy for albumin at this point. No a gene to produce albumin. There is recombinant coagulation products, but there's not a viable commercial recombinant albumin or immunoglobulin. Uh, they're working on it. The golden ring, uh, but as of today, it doesn't exist. So what I was trying to show you here is again when you look at the proteins. Based on the size, we're showing that albumin is the most abundant. Coagulation factors, <coughs> the least. So here's a donor. You can see he's hooked up to a plasmapheresis machine. You can see the bottle of plasma here. Uh, Griffles has over 300 donor centers nationwide. And they're collecting, you know, this, is, this number has always astonished me, but they're collecting 40 
5,000 donations per day. Per day. And many of these centers are open six, seven days a week. Many of our donors are individuals who are working. So donor centers are open early in the morning, in the evenings, Saturdays, Sundays, whatever it takes to get the plasma that the company needs. Every single donation has to be fully tested, primarily for these different uh, viruses as you can see here. Decades ago, many hemophilia patients died because they were infected with HIV when the whole HIV disease state was just coming up. And I think a lot of people still didn't really know what it was. How do you get it? Can you transmit it? And unfortunately, uh, a lot of hemophilia patients passed from HIV. So the FDA, scientists, industry work together to make sure that this doesn't happen again. So one of the things we do is test every single donation. Again, this is adding to the cost. In the, the effort that it takes. Um, even if I donate on a Monday, if I go back on a Thursday, I still have to, we still have to test the donation all over. So every single unit fully tested. We have two huge laboratories in Texas where all this testing is done. And then we get into the production process. So again, we've talked a little bit about collection and testing. Now I want to focus on what we're doing, for example, here at the plant in Los Angeles. So first, here in Los Angeles, we're processing about 6,000 donations or plasma bottles per run. And right now they're doing 10 to 11 runs a week. So, and we're the smallest of the three plants. So we're talking about 60, 70,000 donations per week, and we're the smallest. So this is, the, this is where the science comes in within the manufacturing process. So basically what we're doing is precipitating out different proteins. So, so with all the thousands that you're collecting, is that enough to supply the needs? Well, when you look at this on a global basis, probably not. Uh, but uh, again, there's a, a fine balance of how many centers itself? can you? For LA is there? Yeah. For the is U.S., yes. Yeah. Because again, Griffles is not the only company. Oh, I see. So when you look at U.S., this is a very high reimbursement paid country. <coughs> the patients who are using these products in the U.S. are, are treated very well. So they're taken care of, as they should be in my opinion. Uh, but yeah, it's a, okay. it's a big deal. But thank you for that. So this is the first crude separation we're doing. We're using, we're adjusting pH, temperature, ethanol concentration, so this is ETOH fractionation process, and sodium levels. We precipitate out a different group of proteins from those hundreds. We run that solution through a filter press or a centrifuge, collect that precipitate, and then go on to the <laughs> next step and start adjusting pH and temperature and ethanol concentration again. And we go on to the next step until we have all of these different fractions we're showing here. And then you can see here that these intermediate fractions are then later purified into albumin, immune globulin, factor eight. We also make a product called alpha-1 proteinase <coughs> inhibitor. We don't make it in Los Angeles, but we do make it in North Carolina and Spain. And this is used to treat a hereditary form of emphysema. You're, you're precipitating out the things that are in the least amount in that first. And then you finally get the albumin, which is the most. Yes. Is there a reason why you do that in manufacturing? Uh, we would have to ask the scientists. I'm definitely not a scientist. <laughs> but no, no, it's a good question, but I, I couldn't honestly tell you. What I can tell you, though, is on this first step, we don't adjust pH, we don't adjust anything. We're able to just take it right off. And that may be one of the reasons. Okay. Yeah. And what are the products that is getting manufactured in LA? Factor eight, factor nine, and new globulin and alkaline. Okay. 
There are other proteins, but are they commercially viable? And is there enough of that protein in the plasma we're collecting? Uh, but yeah, there are other proteins, but I'm talking about the key ones. And again, the ones that we're manufacturing here in Los Angeles. So since LA doesn't do the um, alpha proteinase inhibitor, yep. does the fraction for one paste get discarded, or does it get sent it, to? Good, excellent question. It all depends how much more they need. But yes, we would send quite a bit of this paste to North Carolina. Not 100% though, because they would have enough of their own plasma. And again, there's only certain demand and market for certain proteins. But yes, we, we are able to do that. In the past, we would also, as alpha, sell some of these fractions to some of our competitors even. But that's not the case anymore. We don't sell any fractions to competitors now. Excellent question. So here's how we start the process. I like to use photos for the students so they can understand kind of get a better picture of what this industry is really like. Uh, but here we're starting the process loading <laughs> frozen plasma bottles. Again, the proteins are not stable. So these plasma bottles are frozen at minus 25 degrees C or colder. And that's how we keep them stored until we're ready to process. So we start by loading this very expensive car wash. First thing we do is rinse the bottles with very warm, very clean water. Serves two purposes. One is we're trying to clean the outside of the bottle that's been handled because we want to be as clean as possible in this entire process from day one. The other thing we're doing is creating a, a, a skin thaw, the plasma. Because I guarantee you that if you chop the top of this bottle off and try to shake it out, you'll be there for days. <laughs> <laughs> so next step, we're actually drying with filtered air the outside of the bottles. Can you guess why we're doing that? Because any water that's on there will collect we don't want it to go with the pro in the in the plasma. This is how it challenges the students. Because you're going to puncture it eventually. Is that it? Okay. We're going to cut <laughs> cut the top of the bottle off. Use this robot arm here. Pick up four bottles at a time, and then you can see the actual slug of plasma going into this chute. And again, we're talking scale here, right? This is on the second floor because the tank has, is huge and it's on the first floor. What volume are these bottles? About 800 mLs. So the bottle itself is about a liter bottle empty. Here's the top of some of the reactor tanks for the fractionation process that I spoke to. And again, this is the second floor. You can also see how our technicians are bound up. Here's a BKA centrifuge. It's a centrifuge on steroids. So our manufacturing technicians are <coughs> assembling this unit, hooking up the reactor tank to start the plasma flowing through there, monitoring temperature, pressure, flow rate to make sure we're getting the optimum separation. And then when they're done, they collect the precipitate, store it, and then we have to clean everything, set it up, go through it again. This is a filter press. Let's see the size of some of these pieces of equipment. So when we're talking about production, we really are looking at six key objectives. Separation and purification. Separation to me, I use this term to talk to the fact that we have many more proteins that we want at the end. So we need to separate those. Purification, uh, we actually have to use and add certain chemicals for some of these separation steps. 
that we don't want in the final product. So we have to remove those. Virus inactivation and removal. We talked about all the testing that we do for plasma, but the other thing that's happened now since that horrific episode decades ago is that every process flow has intentional steps that will either kill virus or remove virus. So if a virus happened to get through, we would either kill it or remove it through the process. That has to be fully tested and validated to prove to the FDA that we're able to do that. So again, key step. Concentration, we remove water throughout the process to get to these final 20 ml vials, for example. Stabilization, we talked about that. We are adding stabilizers to these products. It could be a different stabilizer depending on the product line itself and what's more effective for that particular protein. And then one key thing here is sterilization. These are biologicals. You cannot terminally sterilize these vials. But what I mean by that is, for example, if you're in a hospital and you see a bottle of saline, that saline was filled into a vial, capped, and before any, the very next step would be that it's put into an autoclave. So these are filter sterilized? Put into an autoclave, sterilized, and there's no chance of an outside microbe mm -hmm. or contaminant getting into the vial. Here, you have to sterilely filter the product, but at that point, you still need a, a sterile container. <laughs> have to put it in a sterile container. So you're exposing the product again to get it into that vial. And that happens in, you can imagine, a very, very clean room. It's very well controlled. A lot of media challenges to make sure, because we're talking about not one single microbe in millions and millions and millions of bottles. How are we doing on time? Are we okay? Here's one of the purification areas for factor eight protein. Again, when I can, I also have photos of our employees there so you can see the, the size of the operation. Here is the immune globulin process. And again, this is the only thing on the second floor is the tank lid. This is an ultrafiltration unit that's used to concentrate immune globulin. Griffles is unique from the perspective that they have their own engineering company in Spain. So Griffles actually designed and manufactured this UF unit for us. And I was happy because I got the family discount. <laughs> this is about the smallest piece of equipment we use. It's a basket centrifuge. Here is where we're getting the vials prepped for washing and autoclaving prior to the aseptic filling. Uh, so we're checking all of these vials to make sure that cosmetically... Optical purity? Is that what they're doing? Some sort of optical No, it, it, it's a little, little simpler than that, to be honest, but you'll understand in a moment why we do this. They're looking for cracks, flaws, okay. yeah. cosmetic defects, because it's much cheaper to throw an empty bottle away no, than a full one with $800 worth of product. <laughs> then we use very hot water water for injection to wash the vials inside and out. And this is the filling process that's happening in a very, very clean room. Griffles engineer designed this unique process for filling vials. And when we're filling, there is no humans in this room. As humans, we're still the largest contaminant source ever. <laughs> And then we put over seals to make sure that it stays in the grill. So you just got a tour of the plant. We do tours for a lot of uh, the community colleges that we work with. Because again, as individuals think about getting into this field, we want them to see and feel what it's like. So it's important. But there is an age limit, right? Uh, we can't... have done some high schools. Yeah, but generally, it's, we don't like to go into the junior high schools or any younger than that. So 
So the next best thing are the video recordings of the facilities and people working at the facilities, um, which you know I'll give you some links to yep. that you could share with the students. And, and, and we try to do that also. Yeah. yeah. So this, mm -hmm. uh, I'm switching now to jobs. Yeah. So we have a, the total got cut off on my slide. I apologize, but there's about 820 or so people here. First thing I want you to know, again, we're a full commercial production facility, is that half of the people are working in manufacturing. So this is the job we hire for the most, entry level technicians. And then we have quality assurance, quality operations. We have our own maintenance folks. We could do almost most of our own repairs because when you're running a 24 seven operation, you can't wait until a day or two for someone to show up to fix something. Especially if you have a million or two million dollars of product at stake. So our maintenance coverage is 24 7 also. Quality assurance, quality operations, a QC lab, administration, warehousing, a big validation group. So we have to test and prove that every piece of equipment or new process or change that we want to make works. And then we have a very small technical support group. I wouldn't call it true R&D because most of that's done in North Carolina and Spain. So again, manufacturing is what we're hiring the most of in regards to, to positions. Uh, we want individuals who have at least a high school diploma, but we prefer to have an associate's degree or a certificate which is where a lot of our efforts have been working with community colleges. Supervisors and managers, again, ideally bachelor's degrees, 24 seven operation. We have five different shifts that people can work. So we have many students, for example, who continue their education, who like the weekend shifts. They work 12 hours Saturday, 12 hours Sunday, 12 hours one other day of the week get a full paycheck and have four days off. Also have a lot of uh, families or young families here so that they can save money on daycare. It's insane, right? Yeah. Quality, again, you'll see here that most of our quality positions require a minimum associates or bachelors. Within the lab, also chemists or microbiologists all require a bachelor's. Some companies will allow folks with associates. It's not like if you can't train someone to do some of these tests, but we do ask for this minimum because a lot of people will grow here into other roles in the company. Yeah, because this is, we can consider this almost like the entry level for someone that has a bachelor's degree at our company. And uh, again, generally, when you're talking about upper management, you're not just looking for years of experience, years of good performance, but also a master's or a PhD at that level. It's a more technical job, technical operation. Maintenance, again, we have automation, mechanics, instrumentation, calibration, <coughs> refrigeration, <coughs> we have a lot of refrigeration because most, a lot of this processing has to be with cold temperatures. And we make our own clean water, clean steam, filtered air, so our own utilities group also. This is my favorite slide of the whole presentation because this is a snapshot of pretty much all of the positions we have at Griffiths Biological. <coughs> Do you support employees or in, in any way to um, continue their education so that they can? Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, let me come back to that, but that's, uh, thank you for reading that up. So, one of the things to understand about this industry, and not just Griffles, I'm talking about industry, is that there are job opportunities for all facets of education. And then we hope that we can grow the individuals once they're in the company. So 
if you have high school students and they're not the ones who are going to be the doctors or the lawyers or, or there are still ways to get into this amazing industry and to save lives with other certificates or backgrounds. When I do this presentation for high school students, because I have gone to many high schools to do the same presentation, I promise them that if they graduate from high school and come running straight to Griffles, I'm not going to hire them. I want them to go get a six month, 12 month certificate, get more prepared, or have related work experience, right? But not too many people do this. So it's hard to find experience. So here are the jobs that require a minimum high school diploma, but our preference is certificates at a minimum. Some training, some background. These are associate's degrees, minimum. Bachelor's degrees. And master's PhDs. So again, the whole, the whole gap. <coughs> And I think that that's, for me, one of the great, <coughs> great opportunities, great things to understand if people, are, again, want to enter the health field arena or career and may not have that technical degree or may not have that technical degree yet. And again, over half of the people who are hiring are basically technical. So from a salary perspective, if we focus, if you'll allow me and we focus on those entry level technicians, uh, the starting pay for a technician with zero experience, and maybe a certificate that they've gotten at Valley Valley College with a six week <coughs> program there, it's very effective, is $22 an hour, uh, plus benefits plus overtime, plus shift premium, plus company bonus if we do well. So they're easily making over 50,000 even in that first year, very easily. And the nice thing about the way it's set up at Griffles, and to me this is really the key, in one year, if they've done a satisfactory job, satisfactory, uh, they automatically get promoted to a Tech 2, which is a little under $26 an hour. So within a 12 month period, you're talking about individuals that can easily be making over 60,000 a year in one year. We have technicians who are easily getting paid 80, 90,000 a year because they're very experienced, higher levels of position. Our supervisors, right off the street, when I say right off the street, I mean if I'm promoted tomorrow to a supervisor, uh, my starting salary is 90,000 a year. So you're talking about some good paying careers here in this industry. I want to talk about tuition yeah. reimbursement. So I would say that 90% of our promotions are internal. You still have to qualify. But for an individual, for example, that runs across the street to Cal, to Cal State LA to work, finish up their bachelor's degree work, come back, apply for a position that they now qualify for. And if they have a good reputation, most chances are pretty good they'll get that promotion. Nothing would make me happier, I gotta tell you, nothing. So we uh, reimburse up to 5,000 per year for associates or bachelor degree programs and 10,000 per year for master's programs. It's important, it's important because you wanna prepare that next level of supervisors, managers, everything above. Uh, the other thing between what we call pay time off, being that we're a European owned company they love their vacation over there, I gotta tell you. <laughs> but after 12 months, 
-hmm. And a combination of both, they're accruing four weeks of pay time off per year. This is unheard of in most US companies. Pretty good company to work for. And again, I would like to go out and say that many of our competitors and other companies in the industry have very similar lucrative packages. You know, we, we want people to stay. It'll easily take us, for example, for a technician, 12 